And this is going to be a little evolution of his thinking. All right. But this is what he, this is what he said at one point. <laughs> okay. This, so I put this up here just so you get a context of where this guy's at. Right. He says religion is but a desperate attempt to find an escape from the truly dreadful situation in which we find ourselves. No wonder then that people feel the need for some relief that gives them a sense of security. Listen, he's not totally wrong there, right? I mean, he's he's looking at it from the standpoint of an atheist. We look at the gospel as a yeah, it does save us, right? It's we we cling to the yeah, iron exactly. rod, so it, right, it gives us a sense of security. This is true. Uh, he just it's it's the attitude in which he says it, right? He says, and no wonder that they become very angry with people like me when we say this is illusory. All right, this is a statement, right? So this is a statement. All right, so he is famous for one thing. Well, he's famous for a lot of stuff. He's in. You'll see what's going on here. But he coins a phrase that we use in terms of the creation. He's the guy that coins it. Does anyone know what the phrase is? The Big Bang. This is the guy that coins the phrase, the, the Big Bang, right? So the Big Bang, right? right now, you recognize that diagram as the, that's the Big Bang in, in terms of what it, what we perceive it, right? There was a quantum, uh, uh, fluctuation and and Hawking's and Penrose are the ones that, that they they discover through physics that listen everything started as a as you go back in time things get closer and closer and closer right. and they mathematically they go it's okay everything was just everything was there right mm -hmm. and so he coins this phrase as Big Bang so when he coins this phrase as a Big Bang is that how do we, how do, and I, we, we, we take this as a kind of a diss, but Christians kind of take this phrase because as they start talking about the Big Bang, one word that scientists started to use was in the beginning, <laughs> right? So the Big Bang started to be, we kind of think that's as a, as something that the atheists would really like, but the atheists don't like that because it denotes that there was a, a beginning. And so there's a ton of there's a ton of theories out there that instead of this being a beginning that the, there was a static universe it always existed right it just always existed and so atheists really do hate or atheists really do hate this phrase of the big bang because it denotes that there is a beginning right now whether he meant that he just kind of there's the big bang and and uh, atheists well, have been trying to God said let there be light wouldn't the big bang be well so. So the physics on it is kind of stuff. So here's so continuing with uh, Fred Hoyle. Then, then he did then a discovery which which uh, one which Hoyle himself uh, helped to make eventually shook his atheism. Hoyle played an important role in uncovering a set of what physics uh, physicists call fine tuning parameters of the universe. He's the one that discovers this, and it, once he discovers this, he's like, whoa. Maybe I'm wrong. There is there is something going on here in terms of creation, right? And uh, this is this phrase called fine tuning. So what is what is fine tuning? Fine tuning in physics refers to a discovery that many pro uh, properties of the universe fall within extremely narrow and improbable ranges that turn out to be absolutely necessary for complex forms of life, or even complex chemistry, and thus any conceivable form of life to exist. Right. And this is a phrase that they use in, in, in I mean, in science, especially, you know, phys physics and biology. It's this fine tuning that, listen, there, there, there has to be something that goes on that just couldn't happen by chance. All right. So this is Paul Davies. Now, he's a big wig. You can look him up. Okay. Um, he has said, there is now broad agreement among physicists and cosmologists that the universe is in, in several respects fine-tuned fine -tuned for life. Many physicists refer to this fortuitous values of these factors as anthropic coincidences. Uh -huh. All right. They're just saying, listen, for this to actually happen, this is just one big coincidence. Yeah. Right? Sure it's, a big, it's a big coincidence. All right. That, so instead of saying, instead of saying, a uh, you know, there's intelligent design. Now, and th this goes up, this goes a whole different way when they talk about intelligent design. You know, they'll go, well, okay, there are aliens out there that are doing whatever. You know, if you want to say, hey, some other people on a different planet created this earth and put people on it, and you call them aliens, 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if alien is your word for God, it's still right. it's still Yeah. So he knows that there is a creator. Right. So anthropic, they call it anthropic coincidences. All right. So part of this is then called uh, entropy. Does anyone know what entropy is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Pretty much chaos. It is things pretty much falling apart. Decomposition, right? The force is falling apart and going, and as time goes on, things are going to expand further and further out. Got it. Okay. Entropy, yeah, we need to do that. Everything tends towards to go towards a more chaotic state. So if you have something of a high entropy, it means it's in a more chaotic state. Okay. And everything tends to increase entropy. Okay. So there's high entropy and there's low entropy, right? So there's high degrees of disorder or randomness in the system. There's low degrees of it. So as an example, high or low entropy? It's low. It's very low, right? There's only a certain number of things you can do to make that, you know, to make that look neat, right? This would be high entropy, right? There are numerous, there's countless ways to, you know, make a mess. So... When you have uh, you have these two guys, you recognize them, right? Mm -hmm. Stephen, Stephen Hawking's, and this is his. This is his, and he's pretty famous in his own right. But Hawking's drew a lot of attention just because of his his physical circumstances, and uh, both brilliant men, right? But this is this is uh, Roger Penrose, and they were both. They did a lot of a lot of things together. Uh, but here's kind of their big thing, uh, and this comes from Penrose. Hawking's was the one that really did discover that. The universe, you know, it, it everything kind of narrows back to a, to a beginning, right? Penrose determined that getting a universe such as ours with highly ordered configurations of matter required an exquisite degree of fine-tuning and improbable low entropy set of initial conditions. Penrose determined that the, the observed entropy of the universe was extremely improbable in relation to all the possible entropy values it could have had. And particularly, he showed that there was a 10 to the 10th to the 101 configurations of mass, en mass energy, a vast number that corresponded to a highly ordered universe like ours. But he, but, he had, but he had also shown that there were vastly more configurations, 10 to the 10th to the 123rd, that would generate a black hole-dominated uh, universe. And this, this was his big thing was... What were all the physics that kept the universe from just being a, a mess that would support no life? Mm -hmm. And it really centered around black holes that these things would just swallow everything up, right? Yeah. He concluded that the conditions that could that generate a life-friendly universe are extremely rare in comparison to the total number of possible configurations that could exist at the beginning of the, in the beginning of the universe. Indeed, dividing 10 to the 10th power to 101 by 10 to the 10th power 123 just yields the same number, 10 to the 10th to the 123rd. That 10 to the 10th to the 123rd is so much huger than 10 to the 10th to the 101 that it just swallows it up. It's just like, it's like dividing 100 by 0 0.00001. It just is, it just swallows it up. It's just, it basically, you basically get the same number, right? So uh, in other words, a calculation or a, a calculated entropy implied that out of the many possible ways the available mass of energy in the universe could have been configured at the beginning, only a few configurations would result in a universe like ours. All right. So now the, the numbers are big, right? So hold tight on the numbers. All right. So here's the numbers. This just comes from the webpage. It's, uh, it's the universe today. It's run by NASA, right? The mathematical expression 10 to the 10th of the 123rd represents what mathematicians call a hyper exponential number. It's 10 raised to the power of 10 or 10 billion raised again to the power of 123rd. So do you get what's going on there? You take 10 billion and you times it by itself. You go 10 billion times 10 billion is, that gives you that number. Then you times it again, that number by that number you times it again out to 123. That's a whole lot of zero. <laughs> well, so, so, so here's, here's how big it is, right? To put that number in perspective, it might help to know that physicists estimated that the whole universe contains only 
10 to the 80 elements of particles. That's a one followed by 80 zeros. That's how big that number is. To give, to put it in another perspective, they estimate that our sun weighs 10 to the 36 grams. Wow. All right. So 10 to the 36 grams is the weight of our sun. So 10 to the 10 to the 80, they estimate that all the all the elements in the in the universe is a one followed by 80 zeros. That that's how big that number is, right? So if we tried to write out this number with a one followed by all the zeros that would be needed to represent accurately without the use of exponents, that's that one, that 10 times 10 to the 123rd. If we were trying to write that out with all the zeros, there would be more zeros in the resulting number than there are elementary particles in the entire universe. That's how big that number is, right? He is saying the chances, so the, the, so Hoyle is saying, listen, the chances of life happen, the universe just happening to support life. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. <laughs> it's not a coincidence, right? It's one to the, it's 10 to the 10th to the 123rd. Has anyone else ever seen vision before? <laughs> there you've had it. I don't know if you've ever had it, but there it is now. That's 100,000 quadrillion vincentillion atoms. I guess they have no, I guess they got a, a they got a word for every, no, I, it's, I, well, it's, it's, un, it's uncomprehensible, right? It's incomprehensible. Right. Yes. Oh yeah. By, by, by far, by far, by far. Yeah. That number, that, that number is just, that's, that's so small in comparison. It, it, yes. You divide it by that and it's still itself, right? So what about life? All right. So what about life? That's just talking primarily about okay, the universe, a universe that's created that can support life. That's just the supporting okay. of life, not the actual creation right. of life. Right. Right. Okay. So initially, many scientists thought purely, uh, purely chance interaction between mo molecules in the Earth's ocean or some favorable environment could explain the origin of information in DNA. One of the things that they, one of the things, and this gets into a whole different thing. We we don't even have time to talk about this. But we can we can combine we can combine things, but we've never been able to. He talked. It's talked about the signature in the cell that there's something and there's programming in the cell that causes it to to create life. Right? We can't even duplicate that. Right? We can we can combine things, but we can't create. We can clone, but we cannot we cannot take elements put together and bring a. And when this is talking about not even talking about life, this is talking about proteins. Proteins, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. So he, yeah. So here we get here we get to this. Right. Um, since the late 1960s, however, a few serious scientists have supported this view of just things that randomly happening. Right. Uh, that comes. I mean, the, the reference. Since uh, uh, molecular biologists begin to understand how digital information DA directs the construction of proteins in the cell, many calculations have been made to determine the probability of formulating functional proteins or nucleic acids in random. Even assuming extremely favorable, uh, uh, favorable prebiotic pre-life conditions, right? Mm -hmm. Whether realistic or not, the theoretically maximal uh, reaction rate, such calculations have invariably un underscored the, the imp implausibility of chance-based theories. These calculations have shown that the probability of obtaining a functional sequence information rich biomacular uh, bio, bio Biomacular molecules, thank you, at a at random is, in the words of physicist um, uh, Isla Prigioni and his colleagues, vanishing small, even on a scale of billions of years. If this could, if this just happened, or be, the chances of it are just, the, he's the, the what's he call it, vanishingly small, right? So basically, it takes more faith to be an atheist. Oh man, yes, that's yeah. a, little, a good way of putting it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Michael Meyer's signature of cell shows that the probability of producing even a single functioning protein of mod of modest length, 124 amino acids, and how many do they calculate in a human? About 540. That that's how long that chain is. I mean, this is a moderate 150 amino acids. By chance alone is uh, in a pre uh, prebiotic uh, biotic environment stands at no better than a vanishing small one in one in or one in 10 to 164. Remember, the size of the universe is what is only 10 to the 80, right? 10 to the 80, right? 
there 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 are more elements in the in the in the universe than there are chances of life just beginning randomly, right? This is a noble lariat to Christian Duvall, and this he's kind of he kind of makes an interesting, you know, he was an atheist and he kind of he comes around to, but he says this, he goes, he's a leading, I mean, he's a original life biochemist until his death in 2013, Categor categorically rejected a ch the chance hypothesis precisely because he judged the, necess the necessary port, uh, fortuitous convergence of events implausible in the extreme. Then he says this, he goes, a, a single freak highly improbable event can conceivably happen. Many highly improbable events drawing a winning lottery number or the distribution of playing cards and a hand of bridge happen all the time. But a string of improbable events drawing the same lottery number twice or the same bridge hand twice in a row doesn't happen naturally, right? And you see what he's saying. Mm -hmm. If you just take a, if we just take a life form and we go, okay, here is a, is there a chance that, and it's a huge, it's a huge, I mean, it's the chance of it happening are so small that it's incalculable, right? But is there a chance it could happen that, okay, humans, the humans, life creates on this earth yeah. one human right but then but what about replicate? but then it, well no it's not even replicate okay but now you got to have the same thing happen for monkeys yeah. you have to have the same thing happen for elephants you have to have the same thing happen for every living every living, living thing on this planet yeah. right yeah. plants so here's an interesting statistic 8.7 million estimated species of plants and animals on the earth now a lot of those are insects Right. Mm -hmm. As of 2022, 1.2 million have been identified. Oh. So you have to have this happen. Boom, 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 over and over and over, 8.7 million times at that time. I mean, who knows how accurate that is. Another thing is like a set of circumstances you have to be in, right? The atmosphere, the temperature, the water, yes. the resources. Right. Then, All of that happening purely by chance? Right. No. Right. Um, that we were on. I, I was like, the Earth is the perfect world. Incredibly any, right place. Any, any, incredibly any right. Any closer now. to the sun, you would exactly. be burnt to death. Any closer to any, any, any yeah. you would freeze. So the chance of this just happen. I mean, this is yeah. right. The the point of it. The, the yeah. chance of this just happening is very low. It's, okay. You know. It, on, and there just happened to be a thing of cookie dough in the oven <laughs> at the same time that it was on. Yes. Yeah, sure. All right. So now let's go back to Abraham, all right? Just kind of sit that. So here we have the gods. They, it's verse four or verse one. They come down, they organize and form the heavens and the earth. And you think about this idea of fine tuning, intelligent design. Just see how this kind of plays out in chapter four because it's kind of cool. And this is a little different account. This is off. Jen, or Abraham is the, it's kind of the blueprint account of the, of the creation that we have, right? Where they, where they, we get the language. They planned this first, and then they they go and do it, right? But just kind of look at some of the language. So first of all, uh, let's start with verse one. One other phrase in there that's different than the the book of Genesis account is what? What's the phrase in there that's different? Yeah, gods. the gods, right? So if you had a, if someone come and said, "Hey, do you guys believe in more than one god?" What would you say? Technically, oh, I'm missing. I said no. <laughs> you what did you do? I said no. Oh, did you? Well, because you probably didn't. You probably didn't. I mean, I knew, but it's just you just didn't want to open that can of worms. But, yeah. yeah. Is it but very... The difference is that it's the object of capitalism is God with the lowercase. Well, I'll say that again. There's in the scriptures, there's God with capitalism and it's God with the lowercase. Right. Right. Except here, it's what? Here, capital. It's capital with an S, right? Yeah. So. And also. <laughs> We believe, yes, we believe in gods because we believe them to be separate and distinct beings. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, if we believe in a heavenly mother, she would technically be considered a god. Well, and that's, that definitely has to play out in the creation on the day six creation. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you read that and it makes it, it makes sense, right? Yeah. So, Bruce, who wants to read this one here by Bruce R. McConnell? Got a reader? Got it? And then I'll get you on the next one. Okay. Elder Bruce R. McConkey of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, in the ultimate and final sense, the word, the Father, is the creator of all things, that he used the Son and others to perform many of the creative acts, delegating to them his creative powers, does not make these others creators in their own right, independent of him. He is the source of all creative power, and he simply chooses others to act for him in many of his creative enterprises. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. And so we say, we say the gods and the relationship that they have to God the Father, right? It's obviously Jesus Christ. It's God the Father, God the Son, and whatever, however, whatever we don't know about. But if it's just two or three or it's well, we you don't know. But in this sense, he's talking about the the gods. It's a it's a, it's a collaborative effect effort that that, uh, that brings about the creation, right? Okay. Um, and then organized. They organized and formed, right? And I just want to put this. So who wants to read? Oh, you're my next reader. The belief in traditional Christianity is that God created all things below, which means out of nothing. Prophet Joseph Smith taught that there is no such thing. The Lord said that the elements are eternal. <laughs> The world, the word create is found in the Genesis account of the creation is from a Hebrew word that has several meanings, including to organize. Joseph Smith likened the creative activity to the building of a ship. Um, just as a shipbuilder needs materials to create the ship, the creator made the heavens and the earth out of existing materials. Okay, and then one last thing, I'll keep going on. Probably Joseph Smith indicated that the translation without form and void uh, should read empty and desolate. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's the answer. Right? I should have colored that in there. I color that. It's a reference there. So, so the main separate those things were established in time. Everything created, not destroyed. Everything is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Change one yeah. Very good. All right. So good. So now, just on your own. You can include verse one in there, but just go through verse one through 25 and just look at the, the creative days and just kind of mark it as you read those. I'm going to give you a few minutes to do it. So kind of take your time reading them. But, but there, there's some interesting phrases in there. Look at the verbs that uh, that are used uh, to describe what they do, what the gods do. You know, went, organized, formed, divided, pause, called, ordered, pronounced, all those things. Just kind of look and see, kind of mark those phrases and just kind of what stands out to you in this creative process that's a little different th- than we get from the, the Genesis account. There's some cool stuff in there, especially as you think back about some of the things we just talked about in those previous slides. I'll give you a few minutes and we'll just come back and share it after we're all done. Mm-hmm. Come up with your favorite thing you learned in all that. Give it a few minutes.
Give you just another minute. So what'd you learn? Why is it significant? How does it, how's, what's the lesson to us today based on something we learned from the creation here? How does, how do we apply it to us? What does it teach us about God? Yeah. Well, yeah, I just thought it was interesting that it said, um, that they said, what did they say? Whenever like something was created, uh -huh. it was, let us prepare. So it says like, let us prepare the water to bring forth creatures. Are they always? Yeah. What verse is that? Well, that's verse 20, and then it says it a number of times. Obviously, they prepared the earth that it would bring. Okay. They organized the... Yeah. So, the back here, this is kind of interesting. If you read 20, if you read 20, so this is the fifth, the fourth day, right? This is the fifth day, right? The God said, let us prepare the water to bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that have and the fowls that, so that I think 21 is even more clear. And the gods prepared the waters that they might bring forth great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters, uh, which the waters were to bring forth abundantly after their kind and were, and every winged fowl after their kind. What does that sound like? It's weird, isn't it? I think it, I think it lines up. A lot of what scientific evidence is suggesting that life originated, quote unquote, in the ocean, that the creatures were only able to survive in the water and then eventually became on land. That sounds a lot like verse 21. Yeah. It lines up, and I think that's pretty neat. Yeah. Now there's not a there's not a lot there's not a lot that ever covers that to find what prophets have said about it is. The, the, there's nothing. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing there. It, it is interesting what the verse says. Um, the process that God does create, we're just we've never been told how that process, how that process works. But we can say this: He's not talking about man in that verse, right? No, he's not. All right, so that's the key thing. I mean, that we tend to lump. However, God created the life on the earth, the animal life. We know that it, it has a designated set period of time. And he calls these what? It's funny that in Genesis they're called days. These are called what? They don't call them days. They call them they call them set times. It was a it was a it was a fourth time. It was however long it took to do that. That was a that was a day or a, a period of time. Like the, the word they use for day, period. A period, yeah. It's yeah, a period, period of time. Yeah. However long it took to do this to this, to the point that they organize it to the point that it obeys. It was a period of time, and who knows how long that could have been. Yeah. So, so I love I like that. I listen, and I'm not saying I'm not saying we tend to we say, okay, if it's evolution, it's gotta be that's not true, right? We just don't, God uses things that we just, be, I think sometimes because atheists say it, we got to be against it, even though there's some things that we go, there's truth there, right? They look at it from a different perspective than we look at it, but 
however God chooses to create the animal life, and he never told us, but I think 21 is an interesting is an interesting phrase there that how he says that. Yeah. Um, so one word that I found interesting after each create after each creation period says God saw that they would obey. Right. They would obey. What is the one thing that he creates that doesn't obey? Humans. Well, so that's an interesting phrase though. So where he creates them in day six, right? Of course, the day six ends on the uh, it it ends on uh, the very last verse, right? Mm -hmm. God said, "We will do our things. They 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 come they come to pass." Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think does he say that after every verse after every created period day four? He says that at the end of oh verse eighteen for day four. I love the, I love verse eighteen. They what? They waited okay. till the things that they had ordered had. And what's the, what's that? What's created on the third day? That's all the great light in everything, right? Well, I would. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that's like a. Hey, what are you doing at lunch? You know, <laughs> let's go. Let's go create a go create a universe, right? But they they organize it, then they watch it until it it obeyed. It did what they wanted it to do. Uh. Does it say it on day two? They saw that they were obeyed. They saw that they were obeyed on day one, on day two, day three, day four. They saw that they were obeyed, day four. Yeah, day five, it says that they, that they were obeyed, right? So day six, it doesn't say that. But... Is it is it is that not true? Oh, well, we are supposed to obey. God created us, He puts us down here, and we have a life to learn to. We so let's see what the, he's, so, still he's still waiting, right? He he Yeah, we're in a waiting period and we're we're striving to become more like him to to obey. And we're obviously not we're not perfect. We have repentance, but that's our that's our mission here, right? To to achieve a to ch achieve perfection, con you know, conversion and sanctification through obedience to to God and His commandments. So I think it's a tr it's true. I think it could have been there, but I think it's not there because this is a it's a this process. A it's a process, right? I think he could finish this chapter at the millennium and say, okay, and we've watched him until they obeyed. And that was that period of that period of time. Although he does say it's a period of time. So that really doesn't work. You get the gist of it, right? Yeah, good. I love that. Thanks. Other thoughts. I hope I didn't take anyone that you were any others you were thinking there. <laughs> Online, anybody? I did want to hit the one in verse. Uh, um, oh, that's a phrase. I, I don't know if you guys picked up on this. Verse two. The spirit of God was brooding upon the face of the waters. What do you think that means? Brooding upon the face I of the. Could not, could not think of Batman. You could not not think of Batman. Brooding. <laughs> Brooding. But they were like, I know for me, like when I'm about to, um, for example, clean my room, I'm taking a few minutes to kind of look at things and prioritize and how am I going to go about this? Which way is going to be a little bit more efficient for me? I'm making a quick plan before I actually clean the room. Yeah. So we brood over things, right? That's kind of the phrase. You thought brooding over it. Brooding over it means you're what? You're thinking, you're hovering, you're, and we said, we talk about a broody chicken. What does that mean? A chicken that's broody. It's back yeah, it's protective. It's nurturing. It brings warmth to the, it brings warmth to the, to the eggs. It, it's, it's, to it's chicks. It's, it's broody. It's brooding over her, over her nest. Uh, yeah. So he's brooding. He's, he's watching over it. He's brooding over it. He's, uh, He's working the details of the of the plan into it, right? 
But I did like that phrase. Any other words kind of stood out to you? I think there's one other cool thing in verse five. You don't get this in the Bible, but it comes up in Abraham. It just says that it just said it was a uh, the, the night and the day, and they called the night and the night and the night and the day, and they called it a day. This one here says what? And this was the first or the beginning of that which they called day and night. Yeah, so it was an evening until until a morning, and then it was a morning until a evening. And then they call it, it was a day and a, a night, a day and a night. So a little, little more specificity on that one there. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else? So in verse four, it talks about, and they, the gods, comprehended the light. Uh -huh. For it was bright. And then they caused it to be divided from the dark. Yeah, so that's day what? That's day one, right? Yeah. So what's that talking about? We know it's not. We know it's not the sun and moon because that's day three. Yeah. Right. They create the sun and the moon on stars on day mm -hmm. three. This is this light is something completely different. What is it? Sure. Yeah, it's the light of Christ, right? Yeah. It's the yeah. yeah. The spirit formation. Yeah. What does it say? Oh, this was a third cross reference on it. Right? Uh, there. And God saw the light and it was good. Yeah. Here's another interesting one, verse 12. Anyone, anyone pick verse 12? Organize the earth to bring forth grass from its own seed. Herb from its own seed, yielding after its own. Kind to bring forth trees and seal you everything and bring forth the same in itself after his kind, right? I think Bruce R. McConkie kind of said this. He goes, uh, compared with the book of Moses, the book of Abraham seems to more forcefully state the idea that all beings could only reproduce after their own kind. Speaking of the creation, Bruce, he said, there was no provision for involvement or change uh, from one species to another. No monkeys yeah, right. It's it's not. That's not how right. So it's that there. That's there goes that theory. And this Abraham seems to be very forceful in saying. I mean that verse. After their, their their kind, right? When they're. I remember a few years ago when I did this class, they were talking about like some sort of scientific council or conference or something that people talk about how they don't know where things came from. They're not sure of the swords. And um, after that, some dude comes in and I go, where did you think of? And he kind of like muttered it over his brothers and walked away, Garden of Eden. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, chapter five. Let's finish up with chapter five. Uh, let's look at verse one through three and then verse five. Uh, who wants to read verses one through three? Someone else read verse five. Someone online. Marissa, you want to read verses one through three? Or who said that? Oh, Mahaya? Yeah, go ahead, Mahaya. Okay, so you see, they're they're saying, here's this is what we're going to do. They haven't done it yet, but this is what we're going to. You see the language in there? We will end our work, right? Right. They concluded the seventh time because of that, that they would rest from all their. And then uh, come down to verse five. I'll just read verse five. And according to all which they had said uh, concerning every plant of the field before it was in the earth, every herb of the field before it grew, for the gods had not caused it to rain upon the earth when they counseled to do them, and they had not formed man to till the ground. So there's kind of this is their blueprint for 
for doing it. And then we then they actually put it in, right? It's on there. Um, yeah, so verse seven, who wants to read verse seven for us? Go ahead. And the gods formed man from the dust of the ground and took his spirit, that is the man's spirit, and put it into him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Very good. So in the Bible, it just says he was formed. In the, in the Moses, the Bible says man was formed from the dust of the ground, right? And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. Verse seven in in, in uh, Abraham gives us greater clarification. What is the breath? What is the breath of life? The spirit. It's the spirit. He puts his spirit into him, and then that is the breath of life. He becomes a living a living soul, right? And then let's finish up with verse. Uh, let's finish up with CPR. Yeah. I guess that that's how you wanna you wanna look at it like that. <laughs> and then thirteen. <laughs> All right, verse thirteen. Who someone read that one for us? Jason, you got it. Okay. Anything kind of stand out to you there? What he says? And the day that it's time. And because at the time of the colon, that means it's about a thousand years. So, yeah, Adam will die eventually. Yeah. And we also have no idea how long he was in the garden. So, was it true that he died in the day that God he died in the day because the Lord just told him when when earth is in that Edenic store, it is still in the sphere of. Of the Lord's time, that reckoning, right? Is that what you're going to say on there? Um, we'll come back to that one there. You want to know who that is? I tried to put the young pictures in. You want to know who that is? Young Spencer Kimball. This is Joseph Billing Smith. Who wants to read this one for us? Got it? Joseph Billing Smith stated, When this earth was created, it was not according to our present time, but it was created according to the full of time. The Lord has said it was created on the left of time, which is full of time. And he revealed to Abraham that Adam was subject to all time before his transgression. It helped us understand the Lord's warning to Adam that he regarded as a taking the fruit of the tree and all the good and evil. And the day that he was there, I thought he would die. After Adam and Eve took the fruit, they did not die physically within a 24 hour period, as we now measure today. Adam did, however, die within the period of one full hour phase of 1,000 earth years, as measured after the fall. Okay. Uh, Moses indicates that Adam died in the years after. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, in that day, it was a long day. The Lord's still day, but in that day. All right. So, there's the, some of the aspects of the creation. So, just with the five minutes we have left, what do we learn from these verses uh, that is a great example for us to make in our own life? And I think there's some great things in here. You look at the, the Lord's effort to create a universe, a, a planet where we can dwell. It's a, it's a great model for how we, how we prepare for our future. Well, we can practice this. Okay. Yeah, we've been encouraged to create, to, to put in work. There's more than one reason why we're encouraged to start a garden, for example. There's a lot of joy and spirituality in the garden. Yeah. Well, yeah, what is it? What does it say in verse three of chapter five, the very end of it? They work, but what's the word they use to describe towards the bottom of it? That's where their decisions at the time that they counseled within themselves to form the heaven. Yeah, I was looking further. Oh, in verse three of chapter five. Yeah, so the, the gods they counsel them, they their work, which the gods counsel them to they to form and to sanctify it. What does that mean? Yeah. Like um, 
set apart and make holy. Yeah, there you go, right? So you guys are here to work. What is that telling us about the work that we do? Regardless of what it is. I mean, it could be your professions. It could be, it could be whatever. But our attitude ought to be what? Sanctify, make it, yeah, and, and yeah, to, to to do your very best work at it, right? You guys go to school, be your very best, your very best students. You're going to be missionaries, be the very best missionaries. You're going to be parents, the work of the home, do your very, be your very best at it. You're going to go, you're going to go in and some guy's going to pay you for time. Give him your very best. Sanctify your work in that sense of making it the very, the very best. I love that. Anything else we learn from the creation? That we should have more humanization than our own. Mind. You should have a passive order, but and then Doctor Huffman's mine is a house of order, a house of. Prayer, a house of fasting, a house of learning all those things. Yeah. 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 What did the gods do before they come down and created everything? Council. They made it for the council. They made a they made a plan. You guys have a plan for your future. You ought to have a blueprint. You ought to have a plan. Say, listen, and, and then you watch it and you watch it until it obeys and you make tweaks to it and you you, but you should have a, if you're just going to go down and go, hey, I'm just going to, without a plan, what's going to happen to your future? It's not going to happen. You got a plan. I think that's a great lesson we learned from God. Hey, have a plan and work hard to fulfill it, sanctify it. Right? How did God do it? Councils with? Counsels with others. They counsel together, right? Does that says does that actually say that in there? Having counsel, verse two, having counsel. Part of your plans are you counsel with God? You count who else do you counsel with? If you're married, your spouse. Your spouse, you counsel with your spouse. Also anyone that you anyone that you consider trustworthy. Yeah, trusted friends. Yeah, I mean you're gonna have those people in your life. Counsel. I love, I love that. Right. A level or higher, right? You can't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. Right. Yep. Yeah, who was it? Stephen Covey said you can only lift from you can only lift others from higher ground, right? Seek people that are that can lift you to to a higher ground. Have have those people in your life. And then there's a big one. There's a big one in verse two. Rest. Rest. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Man, there's great, there's great lessons in there to, uh, from the creation that God says, hey, here's, this is a great pattern for our lives to plan and organize and work and, and uh, rest on the Sabbath. Be, uh, what was the other one I had there? Oh, take counsel, counsel for members. So. Felt like that. Yes, that's so true. So true. Yeah, I mean, we it's a it's a long it's a long haul we're here for, hopefully, and it takes takes rejuvenation weekly to 
to keep moving plans forward and, and, and progressing like we should. So good. Hey, creation. It's not not by chance. I mean, this is there is there is God is behind it. And uh the fact that we're here is is uh, is is proof of that. But the fact that hey, he shows us how to how to live better lives because of the creation and how to uh I mean the whole purpose back we go back to Abraham three. We are we are here to be proved to see if we will do right, see if we will obey. And uh it's a process and uh he watches he doesn't he didn't he doesn't give up on it he he keeps he's he's keep watching he keeps helping and uh, we get to the point till you know he can say hey, they they obeyed welcome back that good and faithful servant right that's the and we have a lifetime to do that we, we are always striving so thanks guys thanks for being here online thank you jeffrey thanks for getting on uh, who was gonna get closing prayer? It was who was it? Oh, yeah, Mahia, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mahia. Thank you. Ooh, thank you. Mike is speaker. Well, guys, have a great Easter. Thank you for the lesson.